Hey there, Dango Stu here. Today's video is about doing a bit more engine alignment and a few other odd jobs, and is proudly sponsored by MarineEngine.com. So up in the hotel at Port Macquarie at the moment, heading back today, but I've just been editing this footage up so far. I figure when we get back, I'll sort of start fresh and just do a whole new video on those last steps to get it fired up. So uh, let's pick up back on the boat. First job of the day was to safely take the gantry crane down and then get on and start restoring the shutoff solenoid. All right, this is the shutoff solenoid, which, yeah, look, it's seen better days, but it works perfectly. I think it's just a bit of cosmetic scuffing and stuff, so why don't we give it a go, clean it up. This bracket obviously is rubbish now, so we'll make a new bracket for it too. All right, let's just unbolt it to start with. I think I'll clean this up with some acetone or something rather than paint it. I think it'll come up all right. Okay, so this mounted here so the solenoid can pull this stop lever. All you need to do is just pull it till it shuts off and then let it go. So, those two holes are obviously the mounting holes and then I've just got to make new ones. So I think I'll just find a whole new bit of metal. All right, let's install that uh, oil filter now. Just bolt it back up here. It's Friday, it's kind of nice just ticking little easy jobs off the list. I feel like you're achieving a lot, but you're not necessarily busting a gut with something too hard. This hose could be rotated, it actually seems under a bit of tension. I think I'll do that later. My goal for this morning is to try and get in and align the two flanges well enough to get the bolts in so that I can turn the prop essentially to bed in the cutlass bearing. So we can call this medium. We did a course alignment, we'll call this medium. And then once I can move the prop shaft, we can get on and do the kind of the ultra fine alignment. People are saying it's a tough job on your own. It has been, but uh, today I've got help, which is good. You ready? I pulled out my old dial gauge. Seen better days. Seems to work pretty well though. It was a little bit sticky before, so I've cleaned it up and lubricated it. And it does come back to the exact same point every time, which is really what we're after before it wasn't. It's actually coming back a little bit further. Yeah, okay, so we can use this, but the dial gauge is relatively useless if we can't rotate the shaft. That's really where these come in. What I'm gonna do instead as a part of a static adjustment is to run these calipers around the outside of the flange and also test the depth of protrusion between the polyflex so it's even. So, hard to explain, easy to show. Let's go have a look. I decided as a first step I may as well just rotate the gearbox until the bolt holes are aligned with the prop shaft flange. Wasn't too hard. Uh, there we go. All right. All right, this coupler needs to stick out the exact same amount all the way around here. So if I, let's see if we can do this one-handed, put these calipers on, they're zeroed, run it down, and at the moment, and let's get it here, we've got say 5.64 millimeters of gap. 
Then if I come around to here, there's 7.24. So the idea is I'm going to adjust everything until that gap is perfectly even all the way around. The other thing I can do is come outside to outside on the flange. Yes, it's got paint and you know, who knows how well the machine, but at the end of the day, that's 103 millimeters and that's 104.6. So we know there's a bigger gap at the bottom. I think using those two measurements, I'm going to be able to get this, well, certainly much closer, close enough, hopefully, to get all the bolts started and spin the prop shaft. So that's my plan for today. So 103.57, 103 103.59, too bad now. Actually, I was just lowering the back a bit, in case you're wondering. 103.47. So, pretty close. The gap on the far side is a little bit smaller, which means I'm going to push the back a little bit more towards me. 104.8. 104.1. Getting there, but let's compare the gap on the polyflex at the front here. So seven millimeters and 6.6, 6 6.8, 7. So the front has to go that way too. So let's make sure the back's backed off which it is. Let's push the front across. By doing this, we're both correcting the angle of the engine and even the flanges up. So this should be a bit of a double win. All right, let's check the flanges again. Point nine, six point nine. That's all right. Where are we here? Five point seven. So it's got to come up. That'll do. Let's not overdo it. Bottom of the plate, top of the mount, thirty point two. Let's just compare the other side. I think our side was 34.2. I think I misspoke when I said that before, 32. So this is 33, so we can lift this a millimeter. That'll move our flange in the right direction and even them up. Now a really great tip a viewer had about the soft foot thing was that as you raise these, you can feel how much tension there is on the, on the spanner. And that gives you an idea whether there's any weight being carried by that foot. If the spanner turns significantly easier than the other side, then you know you've got this soft foot situation. Now, where are we here? On zero, 6.88. So, I can't really get under can I? No. But if we split it side to side we kind of know what it should be. So if the two sides are equal and I make the top equal that, theoretically the bottom should equal that. So I need to come up ever so slightly still. It's got to come down now. Came too far. I think what happens is the polyflex kind of sticks. This is why I think maybe I should have lubricated it. And so you kind of get no movement and then it jumps all of a sudden. So what I'm gonna do, if I can find it, do you have a bit of this? Is as I adjust it, I'm just gonna tap it. And of course you climb all the way around here. 
And then realise you didn't bring the spanner with you. Can I reach? Yes, good. Oh. All right, let's boot up the little rear endoscope and then have a look what the bolt holes look like. So you can hopefully see there, quite a bit out of whack, but let's try rotating, see if that makes any difference. Hopefully you can see there the the sort of, you know, the metal around the outside of the thread's pretty even now, so it's pretty centered in the hole. Now, I've probably thrown the you know, the, the flanges out where they're parallel to each other. So I'm going to double check that again now before we start trying to thread bolts in or anything. The measurement of how parallel they were came from measuring the outside distances around in a few places. What do we got here? 103.9. Sounds like a radio station, doesn't it? 105. Yep. So, we've got to drop the back of the engine down, which makes sense because we just dropped the front of the engine quite a bit. Alright, pretty even again now, that's lucky because we're right out of adjustment at the back. Then if we check the next one along, it's a million miles out, so whatever I did then was just completely wrong. Engine alignment's doing my head in at the moment, so I think it's good just to take a break. He'll put his head back down soon, you go, oh, that's how I feel too. There, like that. <laughs> These are the battery switches I'm gonna put on. Uh, this one's good for 2,000 amps for 10 seconds, so they should be up to it. Little cover, then you take the nut off, get the handle out, push it through from the back. I got two different types, a red and a black one, because I want to make it nice and easy, particularly to explain over the phone to other users of the boat. Red's going to turn the batteries on and off. Black is going to parallel the house batteries for an emergency start. All right, this old hole here, the original hole here is slightly smaller than the barrel of this one. So I'll just get a die grinder and ream it out a little bit. So you get even better. Let's have a go with the step drill. Nice. All right, now we need to drill a couple of bolt holes too. Uh, it is nice to do something simple after uh, wrestling with that uh, alignment. Let's have a look how long we need these bolts to be. All right, just tie the nuts up. A couple of stainless nuts and bolts on each side. And then we're ready to wire it up. Locking washer. back on now the reason this is kind of important now is because we've got the solenoid working for the starter motor but we don't currently have power to the starter motor and that's what this is going to give us so this will allow us to start the engine again and spin the prop shaft all right two switches. Here they are from the inside, all ready to wire up. The overflow here on the expansion tank is completely corroded up.
that particular hole comes through to just here. So when the cap reaches its pressure, like one, one and a half bar, whatever it is, it will allow the coolant to drain out rather than over pressurize the cooling system. All right, comes all the way through now. That was quite a lot of rust and gunk. Now I'm just going to attach new barbed tails so we can run a hose down into the bilge. Without the cap, the coolant can free flow out of here, but with the cap, it takes the pressure of the cooling system to push this spring, you can see, up. And when it pushes it up, it exposes this hole that allows it to flow. And that's how the pressure release works. I just put a new gasket there with sealant on it. It's still leaking. That's annoying. Let's tighten the bolts up a bit. All right, here. You can see this fuel line obviously got knocked when we were installing the engine with the crane. So let's cut that off and uh, put it back on with the hose clamp. Come right back to here. Back in business. All right, there we go. A few people have asked about the current flow here. This is pretty much just an outgoing tide. A while ago, you could really see it flowing from uh, fresh water coming down after the storms. But the outgoing tide hits a couple of knots, I guess. All right, what I'm gonna do now is uh, get these, uh, the fuel feed and the return line and plumb those in. All right, this is the return line. Of course, it's just occurred to me that I've uh, removed the fuel filter, so we can't do the feed line just now. But I'm going to go up and get a new filter tomorrow, fill it with diesel, put it in. old line but it's going now in out what do we got out so this is the return line um, I reckon we have it about here no point having too much blank in it Turn line done, I'll uh, cable tie it up somewhere eventually. But what we need, oh actually I can connect it. We need our new uh, fuel filter, but we can connect the line because I'm keeping the head here. Actually that could use a new gasket too, couldn't it? This is all we really need for the feed line, so let's keep it nice and simple. A couple of people commented on this uh, kinked coolant hose. You can get these spiral bends that help. I could even probably find a bit of heater hose that actually has a 9 degree bend in it. But to be honest with you, I decided in the end I was going to put a hose clamp on it. And Peter then just said, oh look, why not even just use a cable tie? So let's try that. certainly opens it up a little bit more. I think that'll be fine. Let's just cut that off. One day I will see if I can find a 19 mil inner diameter, 9 degree. Guarantee you some car somewhere will have it and you can buy it off the shelf. But that'll do for now. It's around about this time each day I start thinking about, you know, what do I need to do tomorrow, whatever. And I need quite a few bits. You always do. So, what I'm going to do... This is the original temperature sender that was in the boat. Uh, don't know where I trust it. I bought a new gauge which came with its own sender, which is a very, very different thread. So I'm gonna take this out, go up to Pertec, see if I can find an adapter from this thread. 
to this thread. Chances are this is like fine metric and that's coarse imperial or whatever, so the answer is probably going to be no. But anyway, we'll try. While I'm here, I'm just having a bit of a think about the bracket I'm going to need to make for the throttle cable. So I'm thinking a bit of angle line that comes up and across. The cable will sit on top here, but what it means is it needs to come up and across here, but as it gets over here, it can only be the top section. So I'm gonna have to cut the back out. And then we put our saddle here and support the throttle cable. So, uh, let's take some measurements. So if it comes to about the O of General Motors, say, and to the back here. So all up if we make it, can't actually come past there. So it's going to be about 250 millimeters long. And the section that has the angle line can only be 100 millimeters long. So 250, 100. All right, I'll start making that. Well, thanks for watching. Didn't quite get to the point of firing the motor up this video before I had to leave and come up to Port Macquarie. But heading back today, when I get back, it'll be sort of bolts in, uh, just getting some wiring, getting some cable from the batteries to the starter motor. Uh, then I'll have a look at a way to shut the motor off. To be honest with you, I can just do it by hand so we can spin the prop anyway. Plan is to hopefully within a day or two, before the weekend perhaps, although the weather's not great, um, get the prop spun hopefully long enough just to loosen up the cutlass bearing a little bit and start being able to move that around by hand. So we'll see. All right, we'll take care and I'll catch you then. See ya. This is the uh, town beach at Port Macquarie, but uh, the reason I'm here is just to take a look at what the entrance is like. There's a port marker just behind me, starboard on the other seawall, so I presume the entire width of the channel is navigable, but the centre does look a little bit calmer, probably a bit deeper. Looking on the chart, I can see it actually gets shallow. There's kind of a bar going across the channel at a certain point, sort of roughly inside it from memory. So it's pretty flat at the moment. I'd like to come back during the week when the uh, swell is up a little bit and just see if I can see where it breaks. Can't see any sort of leads from here anyway, so I presume they consider the entire channel navigable rather than making you follow leads, but I'll do a bit of homework on that too. Anyway, at least that's what it looks like rather than seeing it for the first time when you arrive, which is the whole idea of these little reckies. Anyway, let's come back one day when the uh, surf's a bit rougher and see if that gives us more clues. So after I filmed this, I ended up talking to one of the local commercial skippers and she clued me into there being sector lights on the shore that I actually walked past on the way back, uh, which are marked on the chart. So the idea is that you, when you're coming from the Sydney side anyway, you're coming from the south, you come past the harbour to the north and then cut from the north side down to the south side as you come down the channel. So it's good to have that sussed and, um, you know, get a little bit more ready for the trip bringing Renko up north.